Thank you for joining the webinar. While you wait for the program to start, please take the time to register as an Antara member if you haven't done so already. The fee is 50 ringgit for a lifetime membership. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that you can enter the chat to ask your questions. If you are having trouble accessing the chat, please send your questions via WhatsApp. You can find the link in the chat. Please include your name and that chair when posting your questions. Enjoy the program. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ah rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. thank you again for joining us on the second episode of the TMTV webinar series uh, videos and voices. I hope everyone had uh, a splendid day today and is ready for our webinar tonight. Uh, my name is Umar Mukhtar Azmi from Batch SPM 2004, and I will be your host for this episode. Co-hosting with me is Sarah from Batch SPM 2020. Hi, Sarah here. How is everybody doing? Please note that if this is your first time joining us, be sure to subscribe to the ETJ channel so that you can enter the chat for our 20 session letter. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight our honored speaker is Mr. Irwan Shahriza Muhammad Razali. Irwan is our fellow MRSM TGB Justin alumni from Batch uh, 99. Irwan became an international civil servant when he joined WHO in March 2008 as an analyst. Uh, since December 2019, Irwan is an internationally recruited professional working in the Federation of International Civil Servants Associations, uh, FIXA, in the field of information management. FIXA's headquarters is in Geneva, Switzerland and was established in 1952 to represent and safeguard the interests of international civil servants and in particular those in the United States United Nations system. FIXAS members include uh, entities such as the FAO, uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization, WHO, will have an organization, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, IMO, International Maritime Organization, UNESCO, uh, UNFCCC for climate change, uh, UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development, UNRWA, Relief and Works Agency for Palestinians, UNWTO, World Tourism Organizations, Organization, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, and many others. Prior to FIXA, he was the manager of the World Health Organization, Global Service Desk based in Cyberjaya from 2012 to 2019, managing a team of service desk analysts to provide support to WHO staff members in its 150 offices worldwide. His professional international experience includes chairing and vice chairing international meetings, conducting training workshops in the field of salary surveys, and participating in the high level in many high level interagency meetings at the UN common system level across. Asia, Europe, Africa, and North America. Whew, that was a long one. So now I'll pass it to everyone. Uh, go ahead, everyone. Thank you so much, Umar and Sarah. For, and thank you for Ansara Muda, uh, Ansara TGB Jasin, for having me here today uh, and for inviting me to share a little bit about my journey and my experience um, after I, I finish from MRSM, um, TGB Jasin, and until where I get. Uh, where I got uh, myself into right now. So this is this is a little bit of 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 a sh um sharing session so that um I mean people say life is a lesson that you will learn when you are through with it. But by the time you're through with it, it's, it's a bit too late. But I hope we are at midpoint right now and we can you know share a little bit um in in hindsight what we have gone through so that hopefully will help you uh, our our viewers um. To take control of your career and, and chart your, your career path towards um, your career goals. So let me start um, by sharing my screen. Just give me a moment. Let's see. 
I hope you can see. Yes, we can see the screen. Yep. The background. Yep, all good. PowerPoint. So if you can see uh, what's on my background here, so this is the four um, stages. It's not based on any academic um, stages. This is just based on my opinion or my experience, um, my feelings, you know, uh, through my, my career. So I'm going to have to put some disclaimer here. This will apply if you are working, um, if you are working, you know, you, you are taking salary, working for, for an organization, association, a civil servant or public sector or private sector, but this is not for you if you are usahawan. And you know, MRSM, uh, Mara uh, produces a lot of usahawan. A lot of my colleagues, they have businesses and so on. So this might not be for you. This is more like how as a salaried worker, you can negotiate and, and chart your path uh, in your career, right? And also another disclaimer, um, all the views here is my own personal um, opinion. I'm not representing the views of my organizations, um, FIXA or WHO. Um, and also um, all the graphics and image you see there is for levity, you know, it's, 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 it's to, 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 to encapsulate a little bit about my thoughts and they, are the, the, they belong to the copyright owners themselves. It's just found in Google, right? So I see um career path as a road as it's just a journey and i see there are stages to it right and the first stage is more like you're a sponge you're on you are just fresh grad or you just finished um college or, or degree and this is the time where when you are trying to build your credibility and trying to absorb as much as possible in your you, you are a sponge you're trying to absorb as much as possible knowledge skills competency and so on so we will go deeper into that um as we go along and then you take your career to the next phase, you know, you know a little bit more what you're doing. You're like a junior professional at this stage. But at this stage, you need to build your networks, find your connections, and get mentors and coaches to try and help you get to the next stage, right? Which is more into a specialist or, or, or junior experts where the organizations may depend on you to pr produce um, complex um, outputs or tangible outputs that, that's um, not easy needed to perform. And then I haven't reached that stage yet, but at some stage, um, and I think there's a lot of our friends in Ansara, with the Ansara TGB Jasi and our Ansara Malaysia, a lot of our friends are already at that stage of experts. Uh, and someday I hope all of us will, will be at that stage. So let's start. Um, and yeah, the format is I'm going to, to um, share a little bit about my, my experience and then I'm going to stop. And then we're going to have a bit of Q&A and, and you can ask questions um, through the link given. So after I finished my SPM in MRSM Jasin, it was in the year 1999. Um, well, I had quite average results. Um, I only have four A's, which is on BM, BI, a Sejarah and Pendidikan Islam. And the rest in the science subject, I did not do very well. Uh, but I would say in hindsight, those are, you know, your, your teenage years. It's more like you're focused on having fun and, and so on. And, and I think a lot of my friends, they, they finished um, their high school with, with flying colors and then end up going overseas, um, sponsorship and so on. But if you are one of those who are who like me, you know, we are not in that path. We, we finish on average. Mm, I would say not to dwell on it too much, you still can change your, your future. You can still change your fate, right? So after SPM, um, I did matriculation, uh, the, the, the Malaysian matriculation program for one year, and then I had to extend another semester. Um, well, I had a dream when I was in school um, to go to MIT. And yeah, there's one, one um, friend from my batch, Mr. Uh, Suhaimi. I don't know if you know him, Bal. He, he, he made it into MIT, but I did not. But instead of MIT, I got into ITM, UITM, Sha'alam. But it's fine. It's still the same acronyms, ITM, MIT, just um, spelled differently. So I was in an ITM for one semester um, doing data communications and networking. Um, well, I guess um, that was not really my my um, something that I, 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 I would really like to probably um, invest my time into because at, at uh, I just I stopped it after one semester, and then uh, for about two years I just went on a journey of self discovery and so on, uh, and then I discovered that I want to um, 
do uh, a bachelor in business administration, uh, a UN program in Kuala Shaya San Melaka. And, and I think that's when, uh, when I know what I want to do and, and I have the passion for that. That's when I, I, I can focus and I can, I can do well in my studies. You know, for the first time, I'm, I'm one of the top students who can go and take awards and so on, which did not happen when um, I was still blurred and still finding my path. So don't worry about that until you settle down and, and you know, find out where you're going. So after I finished my degree, uh, Bachelor of Business Administration, um, majoring in marketing uh, honors. Um, so I came back from my uh, in, internship in Sabah. Um, and it's like, okay, what shall I do? I have a degree now. <laughs> so, um, well, as, as you know, there's so many different paths. You know, some, some of you might wait and look for a, a very good job to start with. But for me, I chose the path of, you know, any job that I can get into at that point of time, I'll just go there. Um, so my first job was a cashier in Parkson, um, Subang Parade. So you might have seen me if you are from Subang Jaya uh, in 2003. Um, serving you at, at a cashier. So for me, and this is one of the principles that I share up there, uh, that direction, there's no failure if everything in your life is a learning opportunity, right? So if you take everything, all your, out, your, all your setbacks, all the times you fall and all the times you fail, if you see them as a learning opportunity, then there's no real failure because you learn from those, um, those um, incidents, all the things that happen. So uh, in my case, I learned from, you know, falling and coming back into my studies and finishing um, with good results. And then as a cashier, I learned um, uh, customer service skills, patience, you know, you, you meet all kinds of people um, at, at the cashier. And it's very nice first experience for me as a, as a real paying job. Uh, and then one of my friends from Emerson, Justin, uh, Zach, um, said there's a vacancy uh, as customer service in Telecom Malaysia. Uh, streamix project and me i've been a tech user since i was like six or seven years old i had an old uh, 286 computer you know with four kilobytes of ram uh, and so on so being a very tech um, person uh, even though my my studies is in business administration but my my strength has always been in in it um because i've been you know disassembling or reassembling my own computers um, and so on so i went into um, streamix customer service and uh, I was accepted uh, uh, into the job. So that was my first, I would say, um, it was a career job, not, not, not because cashier is more like a manual uh, uh, job. First job is customer service. And again, it's a learning opportunity because TM, Telecom Malaysia, gave very, very good, I think two weeks or three weeks, solid training, you know. They tell you how to, how to speak to your customers, how to control your tone of voice, uh, if your customer is upset, how to calm them down and so on. So these are very good tangible skills that I was able to pick up from, from um, TM and able to use it for the rest of my life. So that's very, very useful. Um, yeah, and then from when I was in, in, in Telecom Malaysia in Vets, Streamix, um, one of my friends there said there's this, this new company um, called Datacom in, in Kuala Lumpur. I don't think it exists anymore. It's changed its name to Con Converges or something. Um, they are opening a tech support, um, like a, a help desk, um, and they have multiple accounts. Um, they're supporting Logitech products, Microsoft products, and so on. So I applied to the Microsoft technical support, and I was accepted um, for, for Microsoft support. And here, because I, I had a strong IT background, a technical background, uh, I, I passed the interview, and, and they wanted me to start immediately the next day, 24 hours. Um, and, and um, as you know, I have a one month notice period with VATS, uh, with Streamix, with TM. And Datacom said, no, no worries, we'll buy you out. Um, you just tell them you're going to have to quit in, in one day. And then um, in lieu of that one month notice, they will pay VATS the one month salary, you know, something along that line that they, they took care of that. So I was buy, bought out um, into Datacom, into Microsoft, Asia Pacific, um, supporting Australia and New Zealand. And this is where I learned a little bit about salary and negotiation, because this is the first, I would say, multinational company that I joined at that time. And uh, my, my manager was very frank, um, Harinat Matavan. If you're watching this, a uh, good shout out to you and, and Thompson Anthony and, and so on. So they were very frank. They said, um, me not having a, an IT degree or anything, I just joined on base of my um, technical skills. I got the lowest salary uh, on the floor at that time, right? 
So they were very frank, but they also said that their door is open. At any time I can prove my value, I can prove my worth to the team, I should come back and, and, and rediscuss with them. And you know, that's that's an eye-opener for me. And I said, okay, let, let me try that. So I, I learned, you know, I learned the ropes. I learned at that time was Windows XP, how do you support Windows XP and so on. And um well, I did my best, of course, and, and I was agent of the month in customer service, customer satisfaction. So after about three months, I was able to go back to my manager and said, look, this is my result for the last three months. I'm consistently um, the best agent agent of the month. So I would like to you know, come back to you and discuss um, the salary increase that you mentioned. And they were able to increase uh, from from you know, a certain amount and um, 20, 30% higher. Um, so that, that, that gave you, um, that gave me um, something that I learned is that, you know, you, you're, you're able to discuss and negotiate your salary based on your value to your company. And don't negotiate, don't, don't, I mean, don't be afraid to negotiate, but use facts and evidence, right? Come to them with how, what are your achievements? How do you um, generate revenue for your company? For example, in Datacom, each ticket, they're getting a certain amount for each ticket for each um, happy customer. And I was able to um, be consistently providing um, results to them. So that's my first lesson when I, when I was in my, early in my career that you can negotiate your salary if you're unhappy with it or if you want more, but just come with it with facts and evidence, bring statistics, performance review charts, and you know, show um, what you can do for the company. And yeah, at this stage, right, you are still learning, you're still building your competencies and so on, as you can see from the charts up there. You've, you've just finished your, your degree or your, your, your studies, your college, you have a lot of knowledge in you, right? And knowledge is things that you learn, you know, about, yeah, this, the, the earth revolves around the sun and so on. But you also need skills, which are specific um, abilities, specific things that you know that you can use to get job the job done, right? Like coding skills, accounting skills, you know, writing skills and so on. So at this stage in your career, early on, you, you are still learning and building skills, you know, bringing your skills into your toolbox that you can use later on. So in, in Datacom, I learned a lot about uh, technical support skills, service management skills and ITIL and so on. And also at this same time, here you are building your competencies, which is your behavior, um, how you're going to react to certain um, conditions in your life in the future, right? So this is, at this stage, you're building your competencies. And I would say, my daughter likes to say top tips. So one top tip here, if you're new in your career, uh, try to master your job, right? Try to know, look at your terms of reference or your job description of your job. Make sure you are performing well and you know everything in your job description and you're doing it well. Be prepared to ask questions, but very important, take notes. Because you know, throughout my career, I have a lot of, of time buddying with juniors or, or teaching juniors um, in, and also my team members um, teaching juniors. And one of their complaints is that people come and ask questions. Yes, they don't take notes. They will come again the next day with the same question. And that can be a bit annoying. So, so please bear in mind to take notes and reuse um, in, in the future. So build, build your competencies and skills. This will be useful in your future stage. So that's my early stage, I would say, of stage one of my, my career. So um, moving on, as I reach stage two, this is when I joined um, the World Health Organization in March 2008 as an analyst. Um, and in, in about nine months, um, I became a senior analyst. So in an in a, in a, um, international organization like WHO, in, in, the, in the United Nations um, organization, you don't have um, the notion of promotion like you have in, in private companies. You have to apply if you want to go for a you know, higher job, higher position. You have to apply for it. You have to go through a competitive selection process, you know, interviews, um, exams, and so on. So in, in my case, um, from, from Datacom, I was able to get into as an analyst. And within nine months, um, just to share, like, you know, this is at this stage, you already have some, some basic competencies. So this is where you prove or you try to put that uh, in use for you. So in, in my case, in that nine months, you know, I, I try to be as helpful as I can, like 
uh, team building kind of a spirit. You know, we, we were a new service desk at that time in WHO. We were just going live with a new ERP system, supporting 150 countries, country offices worldwide in the ERP system, plus um, several regional offices and headquarters in the IT system. So it's quite um, quite heavy um, start in 2008. And I try to help as much as I can by, you know, creating scripts for the other service desk analysts to use, um, help to share my knowledge from my past uh, employment with, with the rest of my colleagues who might not know, you know how to solve Windows issues and so on. So by being helpful and by mastering my job at that stage in nine months, when there, is, uh, there was a vacancy for a senior analyst position, I was able to apply for that and use all the knowledge that I have you know, gained over the last nine months and, and excel the interview. And I was selected as the senior analyst. So um, that's, I would say, next stage. Um, and okay, at here, you can see the diagram up there. It's what we call the sphere of control. You know, the circle of control. This is a little bit about how you invest your, your energy, right? So people see me as somebody who is always carefree, happy, um, happy-go-lucky. They don't really see me worry so much most of the time. Um, and, and the tips is that I learned this um, trick from, our, I think, from our staff counselor many, many, many years ago. So you focus on the middle circle, which is what you can control. That's where you focus most or all of your energy, uh, because that's the part that, that is up to you, you know, what you can control, like um, what do you want to eat today? Or, you know, what do you want to do? It's you, all right? And the second um, circle around you is what you can influence. It might not be something that you can do, but maybe you can um, give a recommendation or you can, you know, ask somebody. Um, so what you can influence um, you, you can invest some energy, but not too much, or, or not to worry too much about it. And only you have the, the third circle, which is everything else outside of your control and influence. You can't control them. Like, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? You don't have the power to control that or influence that in any way. So for me, why worry about it, right? You don't worry about something you cannot control, but you can control how you react to something outside of your control, right? So that's in within your sphere of control. So like if, if you know tomorrow is going to be uh, bad weather and, and you know you want to have outside activities, so you either you change, mitigate the, the, the risk by changing to a different date or you prepare umbrellas or anything. So those reactions you can control. So by, by framing my mind and my thoughts in this kind of, of, of a framework I was able to minimize my stress and my worry and use my energy productively uh, in different areas and some of this I must say is thanks to the MRSM system as well MRSM uh, if you remember I don't know about your new your new generation but back in the 1999 we had um, a course it's called Pursus Kemahiran Berfikir um, critical thinking techniques where you learn several methods several techniques that you can <clears throat> you can apply in problem solving and analyzing. And I think that's very useful uh, life skill that you can bring forward. And the next thing that I would like to share is, you know, at this stage of your career, um, you will have a lot of deadlines. Um, it's a little bit like homework, you know, you have deadlines. But at this stage, your deadline uh, impacts your credibility impacts on your um, the perception others have about you is you, are you something someone reliable are you someone that you know if you're given a task will you take care of it until completion so there's one principle that i learned from um, our director at that time mr henry cardenas um, it's very very um, a very good mentor uh, that i had in the past so done is better than perfect right so sometimes you want to sit on the task for a long long time trying to perfect it right but um, you know, you can sit on it for a long, as long as you want, but sometimes you, you, you're, you don't have any ideas, you're blank or you're stuck, but just, just get it done, finish it, send it out in its first iteration or first draft to those who, who, you know, who's asking for it within the deadline, before the deadline, and if, if preferable, way before the deadline, so that you can get their feedback, right? So instead of trying to perfect it, going past the deadline, being unreliable, Try to get it done, um, of course, at top quality, but you know, as much as you can possibly done. 
and go with the first draft and and discuss you know is this is this what you're looking for can you give some feedback on on this work and then you can be prepared to work more on having a future iterations of of your product of what you're coming up with but the key point is get it done right don't don't delay or don't don't um, waste time sitting on on tasks and this would help build your credibility and show that you are some somebody who can get things done somebody reliable and that will help you know, as, as you grow in your career. Okay, and also in this stage, when I'm in WHO, uh, in, in 2012, we had um, like two vacancies for service desk manager, who's going to take care of the service desk that I'm working on. So I, I, I was there since 2008 until you know, 2012, in four years, I was able to, 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 to learn the end-to-end -end process. I had a very good um, supervisors, Maroon, Karam, and, and Norman Sinapen, who taught me you know, how, to, how, the, how the business works, how the end-to-end -end process works. So when there, there was an opportunity to, um, to apply to a manager position, I applied, I did my best in the exam and interview, and Alhamdulillah, of course, uh, everything happens uh, with God's um, will. I, I was able to get that position. And here, um, again, I, there are things that I learned um, and things that I can share on how you can take your career even, even further. So first of all, if you can see the matrix up there, the matrix is a system, right? So to grow in your career, know, you have to know the system, right? And as you can see on top of me, that's the end-to-end -end selection process in, uh, in, in, this one is in WHO, but across the UN it's, it's almost the same. But you need to know stage by stage the process. How do you get to the next stage? Like for example, if you want to go for interview for more difficult positions, more senior positions, what is the process to get there? What kind of, of um, criteria that you will have to excel? What would the panel be looking for? How do, how do they evaluate you? So be, to, 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 I would say, I wouldn't say to beat the process, but to, to win, you know, to, to, to be the best uh, and, and get the best results out of the process, you have to learn the process. So at this point in your career, know the processes, master the processes so that you will be able to um, use them to your advantage. So in this case, um, I volunteered from 2011 to be a staff representative. It's like a union representative. Uh, in Malaysia, I think you have QPACs and, and all that uh, different unions representing different um, bodies. Um, so I, I was a staff rep since 2011, and I volunteered to sit on um, interview selection panels as observers or as staff representatives. And then I was able to learn the ropes and see what are good candidates answers or what are bad things to avoid during interviews. So this is one way you learn how, how to grow your career. And also at this stage, uh, we had a career workshop um, back in my, my, my organization. And one of the things that, that the career counselor was telling us is that you, I mean, we have to take control of our career, right? Unlike in school, in school, you have your, your school counselor or you have your, your homeroom teachers or your class teachers. In school, in your education system, you have somebody to push you forward, right? To help you to move forward. In, 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 uh, in, uh, in employment, in, in, in jobs, um, life, you have to push yourself, right? You have to push your own career um, and you have to take control of your own career. And, and that's the purpose of this um, knowledge sharing is to give you some tools, some tips, um, top tips as my daughter Sufi calls it, uh, on how to, 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 to get the best out of your career. So before I move forward to the next part, um, I'll stop here for a while and go back to the host, Omar. And Sarah, if you have uh, okay, yep. intermission, yep, okay. Right, so yeah, we'll have a short break here for intermission. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll resume in a couple minutes. All right. And uh, of course, if you have any questions, go ahead and type it in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll read those questions uh, at the end of the, well, towards the end of the session. All right, so we'll meet again in a couple minutes.
thank you for joining our webinar session. Let me share with you an interesting fact. ATG is a non-profit organization which supports all of its members, including current students, alumni, and teachers through various programs. Funding for this program comes principally through generous donations from MRC and TGD that's in alumni, just like you. So let's consider to register as a member of ATG, invite your batchmates, and make your difference. So again, a reminder, if you have any questions, please uh, type it in the chat. Uh, we also have, if you're not able to access the chat, you can go to our WhatsApp. I think the link is pasted uh, in, in the chat there. So I will be monitoring that as well. All right, everyone, uh, we'll, we're back from the intermission. I'll pass it back to everyone. Thank you, Omar. Um, let me go back to where we stopped just now. Um, I think it was here. So yeah, so from, from WHO, you know, as, as a manager, I. Um, advanced my career as an international professional uh, in December 2019. So let me share a little bit um, because this is quite, um, I would say, a tough, um, hard to get um, position. Um, and as, as you can see on the screen there, in, in the United Nations system, we have the international staff and the locally recruited staff, right? So the, in, in, in the in international position, you have to compete uh, in a worldwide recruitment. That means you have to compete with um, candidates from all over the world, and you must be ready to serve in, in different countries. Um, and of course, you have the, 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 the corresponding remuneration system and so on. So how do we get there in, in, in quite a, a, um, a difficult position? So I, I began uh, planning for this, uh, it, it took three to five years of planning. So if you are in, still in your early stage of your career, I mean, maybe they can give you some advantage that you can um, have some, some um, insight into how I plan it and maybe you can adapt it to your, your own situation, right? So previously I spoke about know the process, um, learn the process, right? So if you want to get to the next stage um, to get to, you know, positions, um, expatriate positions, hard to get positions. So first of all, identify or know your target, right? Try to look at what are the positions available out there, what kind of a profile or competencies is required and identify your gaps. Um, look at what the position is required, uh, the position description, the, the academic qualifications required, the experience required and spend the next three to five years uh, well, we identify the gap and then spend the next three to five years to close those gaps, right? 
So in my case, you know, I look at all those um, professional positions. Most of them either they require or they have uh, they see it as a desirable to have a postgraduate degree, like a master's degree and above, right? So while I was doing while I was working in NWHO, I took weekend classes for almost two years, two and a half years at UITM Shah Alam. Rashad Ayub Graduate Business School. I think it's one of the best business schools we have in Malaysia. And um, yeah, I mean, I, for all, I think it was like two years or two years plus, I did not have any weekend at all. Thank you to my family, uh, my wife, Maria, Sufi, my, my mom, and you know, they were very supportive because no weekend mean you know you spend your weekend in 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 the weekend classes because on the weekdays you're working you don't have time for your kanduris for your gatherings for a lot of other social activities you missed out for about two years or you try to to, to shuffle it you know, like you have class in the morning until afternoon maybe you try to have social activities in the, in the evening but mainly it's a big quite a big sacrifice for two years to finish my my master's degree you know, on a part-time but but UITM had a very good system for working professionals. You know, they are very understanding uh, on that you have already a workload. They have a, a modular rotational system. You might if you might want to explore that. That means, for example, if you are learning finance, right? They will have finance classes dedicated. You know, you just learn finance for for four or five weeks, and during that time, you will do hands on ex exercises to assess your skills and your mastery. And at the same time, uh, at the end of the five weeks, you have your, your final assessment or your exam. And you know, after that five weeks, you finish that module. You close finance, you put it aside. Of course, you keep it in your mind because you still need to use it in your work. But then you can focus on the next um, next subject, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, marketing or international business. And for the next four or five weeks, you focus on that subject. You learn that subject. You do hands-on you know, presentations, research, and so on. Uh, and then at the end, you do assessment again. So this modular approach for working professionals is very, very helpful because, you know, if you remember in degree in college, you have three to five subjects in one semester that you have to shuffle and run to different classes. But here you can focus on one at a time and, you know, and just master that and, and get to the next subject. So what I'm trying to say here is to get to the next stage, identify your gaps, fill those gaps, invest a little bit in yourself, in your professional and self-development. And also, it's very, very important to get um, coaches or mentors. They could be informal um, or they could be formal relationships, but sometimes they are your, your um, supervisors, your managers, your directors, people that you are, have in your current career or your past career that can, can look at you and give you a very objective um, assessment on, on you know, what are your weaknesses, so where, what are where can they see a room for you to improve, right? Because sometimes you don't see it yourself. Of course, in our eyes, normally we are perfect, right? Most people will see it that way or you don't see too much um, what, what, what issues you have with yourself. So thanks to a lot of um, people who have helped me throughout the years. Um, I think Norman, Maroon, Ahmad, Khan, Henry, um, Evelyn. So many people uh, at so many different stages so give a lot of constructive feedback. And this is very, very important because it, it helps you uh, in moving forward with your career. Um, let me see what I have next here. Yeah, and I also learned something when I'm doing my MBA, uh, the Bloom's taxonomy, you know, that triangle of, of knowledge. And, and I see that this is quite relevant um, you know, because if you see in Bloom, you start with, you learn how to remember things. And then you learn, um, when you remember things, you can um, bring them back or use them, right? Or apply them. Uh, and then you, above remembering, it, you understand certain concepts or certain um, topics. Uh, you know, you, you're able to make sense. And actually, if, if you go through your career, this Bloom's taxonomy is more like um, knowledge, um, in, in a field of knowledge, but this is also something that you can apply in, in your career. You know, when you first start in your career, for, for me as a cashier or as customer service, they give you SOPs, scripts, things that you have to repeatedly do again and again every day. You just have to remember, understand, and apply that, right? And 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 if you want to take your career further, right? And, and you want to um to um you know to go to more um higher positions and so on. You need to be able 
and look at the Bloom's taxonomy, be able to reach a stage where you're able to do more than that. Um, so you are expected you know, at higher levels to be able to analyze, um, you know, look at information, take them apart, explore relationships, what's causing what and so on. Uh, and that's the first stage, you know, analyzing is the first stage because in a, as, when you analyze, you just look at the facts and, and you know, come up with the information and, and report it to somebody higher up. And, and as, as you evolve, you go into evaluating, you know, you're looking at you know, analyze several different options, for example, and evaluate what is the best um, outcome that, that, that your organization would require and, you know, and start giving recommendations and you know, um, use your experience, your knowledge, uh, and all those things that you have learned that I mentioned earlier just now in, in, the, in the journey, at this stage, use that to analyze, to evaluate. And at some point, you have to create something new, right? Um, it, it could be an innovation, something that already exists. You just need to tweak or adapt it. Uh, and most of the time, it's adapting existing things. You don't want to reinvent the wheel to your organization. But sometimes you might need to come up with a new concept, a new um, conference room paper, a new information note to position or something. And you need to be well equipped at this point, you know, based on, on all that you have learned in the past um, and so on, um, to be able to, to perform your job well and hopefully to take your career even further. Right. So I think that's the end of what I have here as, as, as my slides. Um, the last part I have here is uh, luck. It's what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So this is something that you know, a lot of time um, when someone, when you're applying for a position, people say, I'm just trying my luck, right? Or if people say, how did you get there? I, I'm lucky, I just got lucky. So, well, luck is actually, uh, it's, it's, um, it's your preparedness. You know, if you are prepared and then the opportunity arises, there's a vacancy that, that fits your profile, for example, right? But if you're not prepared to take that opportunity, you will not be able to maximize or you know, take advantage of it. So luck is, is when you are prepared, when you are positive, when you try your best, you know, you don't give up. Um, and when the opportunity arises, you grab that opportunity and you go for it, right? So that's all that I think I, I'd like to share at this point. And I'll stop so that we can have the, the question and answer session. So over to you, Omar and Sarah. Very good. Thanks. Uh, I think I want to stop sharing. Good. Let's see. All right. Very good. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I think that was it was really good. I think um, you know when when I we talked about you um, being a, a possible speaker. I think you know you shared your uh, post on Facebook about your career development, and I thought it was uh, kind of interesting, right? You started as a as a cashier, and we move all the way up. And particularly, um, you know, even not having the good results in SPM and struggles in the university, I think, uh, you know, some of us can re can relate to that. Um, I think related to that, um, so question for you is, you know, how do you find that that grit? You know, the the thing in your gut that says, you know, don't don't give up and you know keep trying, um, find something that you're good at, perhaps, or find something that you're interested in, and uh, you know, yeah, to help and, and help you, you know, progress in your career that way. Uh, thank you, Omar. That's an interesting question. Yes, um, and that's something that I, I'm I've been pondering as well how to how to build that that kind of um, great you know, endurance in, in our our future generation in my children and so on. So for me, um, a lot of my role models. Um, well, I, I'm basically, I'm, I'm a gamer. And, and when I'm younger, I, I read a lot of books and, and game books and so on and, and comics. Um, I grew up with Marvel comics, with, you know, role-playing games, Magic the Gathering and so on. Not the PC version, but the cards, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons and so on. So for me, um, a lot of what I learned, a lot of what that I, I, I have right now, I would say I, I derive from games, actually, because I see games is a way you can actually delve into a, a, an alternate or a separate um, uh, construct or, or a different reali reality, but there's always a problem solving um, component to it, right? You always want to win a game by doing something or you know, solving the puzzle or solving the level or something. And for me, that's something that I can, I can do 
to polish my my skills, polish my mind, have a sharp mind by by playing games. Uh, and I know I know some parents here might be like freaking out. You know why are you promoting games? But if you see games not just uh, as something to to waste time on, but it's something to 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 develop your skills on problem solving, especially, uh, and also like you said, grit and endurance. You might lose a thousand times, but you still go back. You know, reload your save game or something, and go. On. Of course, real life is not a game. You know, real life. You, you fall and you learn how to stand up again. And that takes a real lesson, right? That takes really falling down, really being in a very, very low, a really, really bad place. You know, like, what am I doing here? Why, why am I failing this and so on? But when you reach that stage, there's no other way but up, right? Because you're at the bottom. There's no other way, nowhere else to go but up. So, and that's where you try and put your best to stand up again you know, and try to rebuild and, and try to get better. Yeah, I agree. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, real life is not like a video game. You don't have multiple lives. But I think I think part of uh, being successful is is to fail, right? To fail many, many times and just keep, keep uh, you know, getting back up. Uh, Sarah, do you have any questions? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, can you give any tips to decide your career path? Maybe, um, you know, many people out there uh, after SPM or maybe after they have finished their matriculation or foundation, they didn't know to choose their own career path. So can you give any tips or advice? Right. Thank you, Sarah. So choosing your career path, uh, well, that's actually a very difficult question. Because as you can see, uh, I did not really have a charted path. Uh, you know, in the beginning, I finished my degree. Even my degree, I did computers and then... And then marketing um it's well some people have a charted path i mean they know that they want to be an engineer when they grow up they know they want to be a doctor when they grow up but like in my case i think for some of our viewers here you might not know what what you want to do or what you want uh, to be but what i can say is that keep continuously learning and improve yourself you know self-development continuously mm -hmm. and then when there's an opportunity that arises that you feel um that fits you you know try to, to to get into that um um feel or that position um explore it and see if it fits you and even if it does not fit you it's not a failure right it is opportunity for you to learn something and use it when you try something else for example right so i would say there's no easy way to know what is your your career objectives or career goals or, or, or career pathways, but you have to explore and continue learning. And talking about career goals, you might also want to keep um, in mind, you know, at some stage, you, sh you should have a career goal. Like, what do you want out of your career? Do you want a very, very high paying job, but you have to work 12 to 14 hours each day, including weekends, because some of my friends out there are working that style. So that they can, you know, get a lot of, a lot of um, uh, remuneration and so on. Or do you want a work-life balance kind of a, a, a work, right? So your pay might not be, you know, at that level, but you still have time for your family, for your ibadah, you know, for your life and so on. So identify your career goals, uh, what you want at the end. You know, do you want early retirement? Do you want to, to retire at the end of you know, retirement age? Uh, and once you know what are your goals, you can try to chart your career pathway towards that goal. Yeah, I, I agree. I think for career path, um, I, th I think, you know, early on, you know, after SPM, um, you know, Sarah just, just finished SPM, I think it's, it's tough to figure out uh, what what your uh, what your pathway is going to be, right? But I think that's, that's part of the organizing this kind of webinar is to uh, show to, you know, our Ansara Muda uh, different career pathways. Uh, I think, you know, there, there are many ways to get to you know certain positions so i think i think uh, as you continue to watch different episodes you'll you'll see uh you know i think there are many many ways to get to get somewhere all right i think i'll move to the uh viewer question the first one is from mr ahmad afik it says uh Irwan, could you share with us your biggest regret in your professional career Thank you, Afik. That's quite a killer question. And actually, you, 
you, you do see this kind of question sometimes when you go through competency-based interviews, right? What is your biggest regret? Or tell us about a time when you disagree with your supervisor or some of those questions where you can see uh, you know, someone's um, other side, right? So if I reflect back in my professional career, um, a few things that, that might stood up um, when I was um, leading a team, um, the business team, the level two team, I think Shama, you're watching some of our colleagues here. We, we had a lot of, um, well, I would say organizational structure kind of, a, of a, I wouldn't say issue, but we're trying to, to get a mechanism in how this team works with that team and so on. Um, and I think that could have been handled um, uh, better. Um, and also, and there, there are some um, points where there were, there were opportunities, um, like, you know, people were asking um, if you're interested to, to learn certain, um, like, you know, project management or certain things where I did not follow up that, that well with, with those connections. Um, those are, like, I would say, uh, missing or, or lost opportunities. Um, so yeah, this is quite hard to answer, but yeah, um, I, I would say if, if you are given opportunities from your contacts or from your leads, um, and you might be in, uh, at that time busy with something else, but try to follow up on those because you never know when you know those might be useful. You know, if, you, if a colleague from, from Geneva, for example, from a different organization says, well, uh, I have a, I'm planning to have um, an expansion in my team and in the Microsoft support and you know, tell me your views about it. So in, you know, indirectly, in a way, that's, that's an invitation for you to express your interest or to discuss, you know, okay, how do I get there? Or, or you know, to discuss and, 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 yeah. So there are a few times when, when I was given those kind of opportunities, but um, I did not grab them because I was too focused on my current career at that time. And I, I was a manager in a, in a global service desk and I have my day-to-day -day tasks to look at and I wasn't really looking at the future, you know, at what next, what's next. So those are things, certain things that I regret. But for me, Alhamdulillah, it turned out to be the best, but um, maybe it could have been better if, if, you know, if I was to explore those possibilities earlier. Thank you, Afik, for that difficult question. Right. All right. So... Uh... Next question we have from Shamil. Uh, what privilege uh, do you have being an international UN staff? How about you one? All right, thank you, Shamil, my colleague from WHO. And I only found out uh, when I left WHO to go to FIXA that, that he is also from Ansara, from MRSM, TGB Justin. So what a small world. So, well, that is um, not just a privilege, just I would say that's a common question that I get. We know whenever we have a roadshow or a career fair with Job Street, people ask, uh, are you working um, for free? <laughs> is it, it's, it's a non-profit, right? So are you, are you getting salaries? Are you volunteers? So it's quite an interesting question that I've got a couple of times. So yes, um, we do have quite uh, interesting um, salary or, or remuneration. And um, the best part of it is it's... Um, national income tax free right? we don't pay national income tax to malaysia because we already pay um, what we call staff assessment on the un level you know at all those um, different countries kind of a level um, and um, it is quite competitive um, you know, the salaries the, the, the privileges uh, for example if you are a locally recruited staff right um, based on what we call the Fleming principle in the United Nations, um, your salary will be based on um, the best local companies that hire similarly local people in, in, the, in the vicinity, in, the, in, the, in Malaysia, for example, in the duty station, across four different sectors. So, for example, you might take uh, three or four companies from oil and gas, a couple companies from financial sector, maybe embassies or IT sectors. And you, know, you approach those companies, you get their salary scales, for local, locally recruited people, you average those, not the salary, you also take into account their bonuses, their benefit, you average those, and that would be the United Nations salary scale for locally recruited staff in, in the country, in Malaysia. So it's among the average of, of the best, not being the absolute best. 
So it's quite interesting uh, if you are considering your career options now to look into becoming an international um, civil servant. And uh, I think Shamil's um, question was uh, international staff. So it's international staff. Um, you are, your remuneration is under what we call the Noble Mayor Principle. It was set in 1921 by Lord Noble Mayor in the League of Nations, you know, a long, 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 long time ago. But the principle is that for an internationally recruited civil servant, um, the UN must be able to recruit people from all around the world, right? Um, without um, looking at nationality, race, or anything. And to be able to do that, the salary for all international UN staff worldwide is the same. Your base salary is the same. It's based on our comparator, which is the US um, civil service. So all our salaries is in US dollars, and they're all the same worldwide. So you know that a P3, P3 is a great, uh, our great, right? P3 or P4 uh, in Malaysia is earning exactly the same amount as P3 in Geneva or in New York, mm. in anywhere. In that way, you can you can recruit people from the best part of the world, you know, even from expensive mm. countries like you know, Germany or, or Japan into the into into becoming an international civil servant. Mm. And you also have another component which is called the cost of living, the post-adjustment. And this varies based on the cost of living in the country. Like for Malaysia, it's a smaller amount because we have very low cost of living um, compared to the rest of the world. And if you're in Geneva or New York, you have a very high um, cost of living amount to that. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about the international civil service. Uh, in, in, if you are interested to, to pursue a career uh, in, in this um, field. And at the end of the day, you, you, when you retire, you know, like, like, just like civil service, uh, national civil service, right? Uh, if you work in Malaysian government, you retire with a pension normally, right? Or, or EPF. So for uh, United Nations staff, you retire uh, with a pension up to two thirds of your, your last five years salary depending on your years of service. I think it must be more than 20 years of service, which I think is quite a good deal um, if you're looking for a retirement, right? Yeah, that's certainly a good deal for, for uh, you know, two thirds of your salary. Um, all right, so um, next one is from Paloma. I think that's, I don't know that's, that's her name, but Paloma Pictures. Uh, Erwan, please talk about the importance of networking and building relationships. Thank you. Paloma is uh, my, my friend, my, my colleague Shama uh, from, from WHO as well. Uh, okay, networking and relationships is very, very important as you reach, um, you know, a higher stage of your career because, you know, as the stakes go up, right, as, as the complexity goes up, um, your hiring managers, people who, who's hiring at that level, they normally want to look for people who has um, a certain credibility to them, who has um, like a proven um, track record of doing good. So at that stage, um, it's not just what's on the paper, not just what's on your CV or how you perform during the interview, but your background check or your reference check also plays a very, very um, great um, impact on, on, you know, as you go into a more senior level. And it's good and it's very important at that time. You need to have good references, to, good, to have good networks. People can vouch you know, when, when you apply for a higher position and somebody calls the previous director and they say, yeah, I, I know this person. I know Shama. And, and you know, she, she goes the extra mile. She takes care of her clients. Uh, and, and even though um, you know, things can get quite hard, for example, during the, the, the Ebola situation, we had a lot of calls, people calling about uh, you know, different, different topics that are not within our scope. But, but the person still did their best in that situation. So you, you need to network. Uh, it's, it's actually, there's a lot of benefits when you talk about networking and, and relationship, right? So first of all, it's of course someone to vouch for you in, in a reference check, but also it's someone to give you opportunities or to, um, if, if they have, um, if they see a vacancy that fits you, right? They might, they might come and tell you about it. Um, or if they are also hiring managers and they have a vacancy, they might come and tell you to apply for it and to compete for it. Um, and as you know, the selection process in, in a lot of organizations, they are mainly um, very objective, right? But there's also this human factor to it, right? If, if the panel knows you and, and you have very good credibility and um, the human factor will kick in and that, that they will look at your answers 
I would say more kindly, right? Less critically. So those are all the human factors that you can uh, gain by having a good relationship with others, by building your network and connections, and you know, by generally being positive to everyone that you meet throughout your career. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I think we have another one from uh, Sharinizal Muhammad. Share the not so good experience and how you overcame that. And uh, did you manage to turn the problem into an opportunity? Hmm, this is starting to sound like an interview, interview questions. Um, not so good experience. Well, well, it, it depends because me, I'm, I'm quite an optimistic person. Um, I see a lot, uh, I see things that happen to me with, with a civil, silver lining most of the time. So um, let me see. Well, I, I, I don't have a lot of examples on, on this part. You know, like sometimes my, my boss said, you're off to Geneva for three months and they tell you one week before and you still have to put your affairs in order in order, in order to go there. It's a challenge, right? I see things as, as challenging, but I don't really see them as, as, as a bad um, experience or, you know, I see them as a challenge to be overcome, as, as an opportunity to learn and, and to move forward better. Um. Yeah, and and in in the space that I'm working in, I, I'm 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 lucky because I have managers, supervisors. You know, they they have the, they give you the room, um, to expand uh your career. They give you the, the the room to make mistakes. Um, and and you know if you if you do make mistakes, you own to the mistakes. You know, right? Maybe uh one day you give a misinformation, uh, and then you found out that you did that. So you call the other person back and say, I'm sorry that you know I after further research or I find out that. That is not entirely accurate, and this is the right thing. So you own up to, to your mistakes if you have any. Um, and how do you turn problems into opportunities? Um, well, try to look at things positively. Um, um, well, I don't have examples at the top of my head, but there's a few times when I, you know, I, I'm confronted with, with uh, impossible deadlines, tasks that have to be done in, in the next few days or a few weeks, and, and there are consequences if they are not done. And you know, it might take, you, you might need to invest more energy, more effort into that, um, if you want, especially if you want to turn those into, into, um, into uh, opportunities to shine. But, but if you are able to do that, right? Uh, I wouldn't say go and take all the impossible things and, and get them done. But if you are faced with an impossible situation and you do your best, um, it's an opportunity for you to, of course, to shine and to show people that you can do it, right? You can take ownership of this and, and you can perform. But even if you cannot perform, at least you try your best, right? Within the scope of what, what you have. And I think one thing that, that you might not realize until later on is that you can ask for help. Right. If you're assigned something very, very difficult by your, your senior uh, management or anything, and you say you don't have enough time, money, resources um, to do it within the scope that you're required, always go back to them and, you know, and ask for, for resources, for time, for manpower or anything. Negotiate and, and, and um, be realistic and trying to get things done while, of course, being positive and optimistic and all that, because that's just my personality. Thank you. And I think it comes back to like like you said about having the mentors too, right? I think um, you know you're gonna face challenges, and then you know you surround yourself with good people, and having a good mentor really helps you know boost your confidence and uh, any problems that you have. Um, I think another thing I was thinking about is you know for young people now it's quite perhaps quite tough to to find jobs or maybe jobs are not available. Uh, maybe it's um, a lot of competition. Right. Um, you know, I, I know you, you started out, you know, just working as cashier, but what, what do you recommend uh, young people to do now, fresh graduates? Um, you know, what what should they do if they find it hard to find jobs? You know, should they should they volunteer somewhere? Should they start with any job that is available? What, what, what should they do? Thank you, Omar. So that's, that's also a very interesting question. Um, well, 
as you know, I'm I'm a staff representative, a union rep. So of course, I I I believe in employers having um good conditions of service for for their staff. You know, good pay scales and everything. But like you said, right now, um, a lot of employers are having um problem because of the pandemic. For businesses are going down and so on. And I think as a fresh graduate in this very challenging time right now, um, I think you have to try and, and make do, you know, what's the best options that you have out there, uh, whether you want to further your studies or look at, you know, all these um, graduate training programs that's available or do some internship paid or unpaid internship to get more experience or to start small, you know, at some position somewhere that you can find as long as, you know, this is again my, my union rep um, speaking, as long as you don't get exploited, uh, you know, by, by, by companies that pay you um, not commiserate amount uh, for the complexity of the work that you do, but, but try to still be positive and, you know, try to have a way out, you know, like you are there to learn a certain skill, you, you have a goal or objective that you want to achieve, and then, you know, you're using that as a stepping stone to get to the next level of your career. So, if you have something like that, it's fine, but if you if you go and, and you just take any job that you have, but you don't have plans for the next stage. And I'm, I'm guessing if you're watching this video, and I think this is, what, almost an hour or more than an hour by now. If you're watching this, I guess you are starting to have a plan in, about your career. And I think that's one of your first steps you're taking. So, yeah, invest, invest in yourself. Um, take what opportunities out there and keep an eye out on how you can, you know, take control of your career and move to the next level. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, I think I think having this kind of platform, it, it helps, right? Ansara, uh, we have a lot of uh, alumni who have been through it, uh, tough times as well. I mean, they, they were, you know, I think 99, it was a recession. I'm not really quite sure, but I, I'm sure there's, you know, a lot of our seniors have been through recession or, or, or uh, similar uh, bad times, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think... I don't know, I guess if you, uh, you know, take whatever opportunity that's available, that's great. But again, I mean, having somebody to talk to that has been through some, some of these uh, things, uh, perhaps they can also help you, right? Perhaps, uh, you know, that you're supposed to, you know, go into, if you're interested in being an engineer, for example, perhaps uh, interning or volunteering at an engineering uh, firm, that, that's something that you could do. Um, I know myself as well. I, that's what I did fresh out of college. Um, you know, it was bad economically, and uh, I just volunteered, and uh, you know, I got offered a full-time position. You know, I think ha certainly having uh, somebody to talk to you about what what they could do really helps. Uh, yeah. Sarah, do you have any other questions for Irwan? Maybe no. I don't know. Okay. Very good. I well, think. Uh, oh, I, go ahead, I, go ahead, I'll just say no. I fully agree with what you're saying, Umar. I think having a network, you know, like Ansara is the alumni network for MRSM school um, uh, leavers, uh, school <laughs> those people who graduate from MRSM system, and you know, having this this also the social network uh, where you can learn from the seniors. I think this is also a good platform. Um, to help you in your career um, or in, in, in getting opportunities. You know, if you have a business, for example, you can have a business with, within the Ansara, uh, uh, get contacts or get opportunities within. So I think um, a social network um, like, like Ansara or any other society or association that you can be a part of, um, you know, a support system for yourself among your friends, your colleagues, um, would be able to help you know, bounce ideas, uh, find out what's the best way to move forward um, with your career, with your life, you know, with anything that you're having. So having a support system, of course, is, is very helpful. Friends, um, colleagues. You know? So yeah, I think that is quite good, especially during this difficult time um, that the whole world is facing right now. So having um, family members, friends, people around you would help. You know? And Ansara, I think, is there to, to do that. Yep, and uh, you know you can you know where to reach us. We have uh, our information uh, in in this video, and and in, in the link, um, yeah, for, for this webinar. Um, I think you know we're past uh, ten now, ten eleven. I think we we can start to end the stream if 
there's any more no more questions from our viewers uh, of course I'd like to you know thank our guest uh, you know everyone for for sharing his experience and uh, we hope that everyone learned and benefited from this webinar so we also want to thank the small but dedicated APG team members so if you would like to be a part of our team, please contact us in more. So yeah, that's all from all of us. Take care and good night. Salam Thanks, Thank thanks you. everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. 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 Cheers.